and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Hope that you and your family are doing well. I know that there's been a spike of cases of the coronavirus here as of late, but pray that it has not affected any of you. Tonight I want to, before we get into our lesson, I just want to let you know that if you're watching us either on Facebook or YouTube or in some other way, please let us know. Join us and let us know where you're watching us from and just let us know that you are watching. We appreciate that. And then secondly, I want to do something I haven't typically done in the past, um, something I want to start if it is needed, and that is if you would like a copy of the outline that I work from that has my notes in it, so that you might go back and restudy some of the things that we mentioned tonight, please contact us here at the Waverly Church of Christ. I think Evan is putting that on our screen so that you will know how to do that. And we will either get that out to you in a PDF format uh, online, or we can send it to you in, a, in a, a printed form. But if that's something you're interested in, please also let us know, and we'll take care of that for you. I want to begin tonight with asking you just a few questions uh, first of those is this, what is your, the deepest desire of your heart? What is it that is your greatest longing? I think that many of us might say that for the children at this time of the year, it is, their greatest longing is for that special present that they hope will be under the tree on Christmas Day. But what about those of us who are adults? What is it that we want? I know that I can't begin to tell any of you what I think you might want, but I do know what David of old wanted. And he did not want money. He did not want any material thing. What David wanted was God. He longed for, he yearned for God. Tonight I want to direct your minds to another psalm by David. It's Psalm 63, and it is the last in a series of three song, psalms in which David emphasizes or stresses his faith. And the faith that is in this three series of psalms is such that in this last psalm, it finds, as someone has said, its greatest height as we look at how David speaks about God and his faith in God. According to the psalm's title, David lets us know that it took place at a time when, or he wrote it at a time when he was in the wilderness of Judah. The history would seem to connect it with a time in which David was fleeing for his life. Absalom was trying to usurp the throne. David was king and Absalom had come into Jerusalem and David had fled and gone east, crossed the Jordan River and into the wilderness of Judah there on the other side of the Jordan River. And it's at this time, while he's in this Judean wilderness, that he apparently wrote this psalm. Well, as we look at this psalm, it has 11 verses. I think there are three different sections, and there are some things that David says of great importance in each of those. And in the first five verses, what we find here is David is telling us that true satisfaction is found in God. And in the first two verses, what he lets us know is that he had a thirst for God. Listen to what he says. He says, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. David begins the psalm by identifying God as my God. And more than just believing in the existence of God or in knowing about God, David knew God personally as his God. And his relationship with God was not just a casual relationship. No, it was something for which he yearned, something for which he longed earnestly. If you're reading tonight from the King James or the New King James translations, you may notice that that word earnestly has been replaced in the King James and the New King James with the word early. There's a reason for that. The Hebrew word from which that is taken can mean to seek early, and that's the way the translators took it for those two translations. The idea of beginning one's day with seeking God in prayer. But it also, the same Hebrew word means 
an earnest seeking, a diligent seeking. And that's the way many of the other modern translations have chosen to translate this statement so that David is earnestly seeking God. David speaks of his soul's longing for God as a thirsting, a yearning of his flesh. But then something else that I might add, and that is that David compares this yearning he has to a dry and weary land that is longing for precipitation, for rain, just to nourish the ground. David's soul could no more live without God than his flesh, his body, could live without water. And, and the language that he uses here, there's similar language found in another psalm by David. It's actually over in Psalm 42. You're probably familiar with it there in verses 1 and 2, where David says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? David's longing for God is even intensified by a previous encounter which he says he's had or he had had in the sanctuary there in Jerusalem. It, it was there that he, he tells us that he saw God's power and God's glory. It may be that what David experienced there was a vision similar to that of the prophet Isaiah when he saw the holiness of God in a vision in the temple in Jerusalem. Isaiah describes his vision for us there in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. But to see the power and the glory of God only caused David to long for him all that much more. You and I are privileged to see the power and the glory of God every time we look up. Whether it's in the daytime when we look up and we see the beautiful blue sky and the horizon or the clouds floating through or the sun shining in all of its glory or in the nighttime when we look up and we see those celestial bodies which so illuminate the sky and, and dot it all across. David spoke of our response to that or maybe of how God declares His power and His glory in Psalm 19. Verse 1, where he tells us there that the heavens are telling the glory of God and, as he says, their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. As a result of all of this, this experience, David's response is to praise God. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 3 and going through verse 5. He says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands to your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. To David, God's loving kindness toward him was better than life itself. David thought more of that than he did of life-sustaining water. And because of God's loving kindness toward him, David was able to say in verse 3, My lips will praise you. In verse 4, he says, I will bless you as long as I live. And in the latter part of verse 4, he says, I will lift up my hands to your name or in your name. Earlier in verse 1, what David had said was, My soul thirst for God. Now, because of the loving kindness of God, which David is experiencing in his own life, David is able to say, my soul is satisfied with as with marrow and fatness. What he is doing is David is comparing the satisfaction he has from God's loving kindness in his life to a hungry man sitting down at a feast and eating or having his hunger satisfied more than he can ever imagine. This same idea is found in the New Testament on more than one occasion. If you go to John's Gospel there in chapter 4, Jesus is there in the village or outside the village of Sychar at a well. A woman has come to draw water and, and Jesus enters into a conversation with her speaking about living water. And down in verse, verses 13 and 14 of John chapter 4, Jesus would say to her first about the water that she draws from the well. He says, Everyone who drinks of the water 
or of this water will thirst again. And then he speaks of this living water he's, he's talking about. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well springing up into eternal life. In John chapter 6, there in verse 35, uh, we have read earlier in John chapter 6 about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then sending his disciples on a cross and later coming around or across the Sea of Galilee. And they, the, the crowd finds him the next day and he begins to speak about himself being the bread from heaven. And in verse 35, here's what he says. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. So Jesus is the bread of life and he is living water. He satisfies the need of our souls. But for David, God's satisfaction in his life was such that David was able to say there at the end of verse 5, my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Let me ask you, is God's satisfaction in your life such that you can praise Him with joyful lips? I hope that it is. I hope that God is that to you. But not only does David let us know that God satisfies him, but he lets us know that his help is found in God. There in verses 6 and 7, God is, as David describes him, the focus of his meditation. Listen to what he says. He says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate upon you in the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. David says that when he awoke in the night, his thoughts turned to God. As one person has said on this passage, David's first and best thought was about God. But David did more than just think about God. David says that he meditated upon God. And there was a reason that God was the focus of David's meditation. It's what he tells us there in verse 7. He says, for you have been my help. God was David's help. And David found relief in the shadow of God's presence, which he, he describes or he compares to a, a, a mother bird sheltering her young beneath her wings. And it is beneath such a shelter or such a shield that David is able to say, I will sing for joy because of what God does for him, the help that he finds. But not only does David find that God is his shadow, David makes a statement concerning his response to God. And here's what he says, I or my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. As we saw earlier in verse 1, David had said, my soul thirsts for you. Now, here in verse 8, David says, my soul clings to you. Have you ever seen a small child clinging to a parent? Uh, it may be that whatever the, there's a perceived fear in their life, whatever it may be. It may be another adult or a, a, an individual that they don't know or recognize it may be an animal that is larger than them or is, is barking at them or is, is doing something that, that frightens them. And so they, they wrap those arms around uh, that leg or maybe even around the neck of that mom or dad. It may be a sound that they're not familiar with or something that's loud. Uh, whatever it is, it frightens them to the point that they cling to that parent and they will not let go. Why? Because their safety and their security is, is in that person. It's in what that person provides for them. David's faith clings to God. And the reason that David's faith clings to God is because God's right hand upholds him. In the Old Testament, oftentimes, it was God's right hand or God's arm that would protect or defend his people. The right hand was considered the hand of strength. And so David understands that the one who is more powerful than himself is the one who will not allow him to fall. And that is God. God has sustained David in his life. He has defended David in danger. He has kept David from the power of his enemies. 
And so David is able to respond in this way by clinging to God. I want to ask you something I'd like for you to consider. Have you ever stopped to just consider whose hand is holding you up? And not only that, to whom does your soul cling? Does it cling to God? If not, I want to encourage you to cling to Him with all your might. If it's not God's right hand holding you up, then whose hand is holding you? Because God is the only one who can sustain you in the true difficult times of life. There's one last thing that David brings out in this psalm. It's verses 9 through 11. And that is that our protection is found in God. As David says it here in verses 9 and 10, he recognizes that his enemies have no power against him. He says, But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be prey for foxes. As we've seen in so many other psalms, David again has his enemies. And again, these enemies are seeking the destruction of David's life. But David doesn't seem to be as intimidated as maybe we've noticed in certain other psalms. David seems to be more confident. And the reason is because of who is the one protecting him. And that is God. God is the one who, if you remember, upholds him by his right hand. And so because of that, David is now able to say of such people that they will go into the depths of the earth. In other words, they will die. They will go into the grave or into the pit. Not only that, he says that they will be delivered over to the power of the sword. Simply another way of saying that they will meet their end on the field of battle. And finally, he says that they will be prey for the foxes or as some translations say, for the jackals. In Old Testament time, the most disgraceful way to die was to die and remain unburied on the field of battle. Because those bodies which were left unburied on the field of battle became that upon which the beast of prey, the, or maybe I should say the scavenger beast and birds would feast or would feed. And, and it's a grisly thing to consider, but it's what David is telling us. It is the end that awaits his enemies because David recognizes that he is God's anointed one, the one who's been anointed by God as king over Israel. And to, to fight against the anointed of God is ultimately to fight against God himself. And those who fight against God himself will not be successful. So, as we come to the very end of the psalm, this last verse, David tells us <clears throat> that the faithful will rejoice in God. Listen to what he says. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory. David's first statement is that the king will rejoice in God. Well, who's the king? It's David. David's just speaking of him in third person. But it may also be that what David is doing is looking forward to the point in time when he will no longer be on the throne of Israel, but that there will be another anointed one, a descendant of his that God has placed upon the throne. And if that king is true and faithful before God, then David knows that that king will be able to rejoice in God, to put his trust in God. But secondly, David declares that everyone who swears by him, God, or that is by God, will glory. He will trust in him. He will praise God. Why? What is the reason for such praise and glory or rejoicing? He tells us at the very end of this verse, it is that God has stopped, He has silenced the mouths of those who speak lies. This may have been a reference to Absalom and those who were loyal to him and the lies they were speaking and deceiving the people to turn away from David and to turn from him. But as we look at all of this, as we put this psalm back together, we see that what David sees in God is the true satisfaction of his life. God is his help. God is his protection. And so because of that, David is able to say, Oh God, you are my God. There is a, a hymn that we sing which has the same first line in it as the first line of this psalm. You may recognize the words. 
and no doubt you have sung them at one time or other. These are the words, O God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. And then it repeats that, O God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. And then it adds this in the second stanza, I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Is that true of you? Is God your God? Will you follow Him all the days of your life as He leads you daily in a walk that honors Him? I want to ask you to go back and think about the things that David has said in the psalm and what we've seen in this psalm. And I want you to consider this. Where do you find your satisfaction? For what does your soul truly thirst? And where do you find your help? Where do you find your protection? Is it in God? And if so, is God your God? Is He the desire of your heart? If not, you can make Him such today. And, and it's very easy to do that. In Romans chapter 10, there in verse 9, one of the things that Paul tells us that we must do, he says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. And then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter tells us what else we, might, we must do if we are to be saved. He says that we are to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. And in doing those things, not only do we receive God's gift of the Holy Spirit, but we also are granted eternal life. If that is not something you have done in your life, I want to encourage you to do it. If we can help you here at the Waverly Church of Christ to obey God in, in seeking the salvation He promises to us, then we want to do that. Just reach out to us, please. Contact us via Facebook or call us here at the office or, or reach out to us via email. But let us know how we can help you to be faithful before God and to find your satisfaction and your help and your protection in God. Thank you for joining us in this study tonight. May God bless you and yours and keep you safe during this time.